<laughs> We're there. Hi, everyone. This is Brady Volk. This is episode 69 of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I am Brady Volk, founder of the Volk Firm and Nimble This. With us is John Downey, CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. Welcome back, John. It's always great to be here. End of the year. And uh, technically, if depending on which calendar you go by, this is the end of the decade. Right? Right. The next decade really starts 2021. Right. We run into that every <laughs> 10 years. So in our show today, folks, please do drop in your comments into our chat. We want to hear questions from everyone. Uh, we'll be exploring 204 megahertz and OFDMA today. We're doing a deeper, deeper, deeper dive into that. We'll also have a little brief discussion about low Earth orbit satellites in the beginning here. Some Starlink, SpaceX stuff and things from our listeners. Uh, first off, if you're watching, please do hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell. Also give us a thumbs up. That also, that always helps us uh, with, the note, with the algorithms. Um, so setting the stage for the conversation, in the news, there's been a lot of talk of what Elon Musk is doing in his SpaceX Starlink pursuits. Uh, it's something we wanna to touch on first um, before we get in there. One of the interesting things about what Elon is doing, Elon Musk and his whole SpaceX pursuit with low Earth orbit satellites is to provide internet coverage to a lot of underserved areas. He's launching 12,000 satellites up into space as part of the first phase here and getting permission to launch 30,000 more. For perspective on that, we've launched 9,400 satellites since the dawn of the space age in 1957. So we're getting a tremendous amount of coverage in there. And SpaceX also got $886 million from the FCC to subsidize this into 35 states to get coverage for that. Um, now, comparably speaking, there's been $20 billion allocated from the federal government to rural bro bro broadband spending in the U.S. Um, but I, I think it's worth understanding the implications here that this could be a new competitor into the industry. And um, so just, uh, you know, throwing this up on my screen here, we can see, you know, this is this is very real, very legitimate. Uh, we've also heard and, and read that this is something that for a lot of rural regions, including Canada, part of North America, uh, this is something that is actually working quite well for people who are starting to use this service. And I think, John, the, the interesting aspect of this, because we've talked about this before, is how this can impact and per particularly maybe be a competitor for the cable industry. Yeah, I, I agree. We brought this up in our last uh, chat. And um, like, how real is it, right? You know, with uh, the 20 billion earmarked for rural, rural broadband, and some of it now go into Elon Musk's group. And if they validate it and show it's legitimate, like you said, uh, my concern, knowing that I came off a of satellite internet, um, uh, HughesNet. Uh, that, latency, that was pretty That was pretty bad. It was painful. Yes. The, the latency was painful. Uh, loading up stuff, trying to do VPN. VPN wasn't even officially supported because of the latency delay and all that. But if you have a low Earth orbit satellite that's set at 22,000 miles above, I don't know what dictates low Earth orbit. Does it? Did it say how far above? Because uh, geosynchronous is 22,340 or 430, whatever it is, um, above the equator. But if it's low Earth orbit, is it you know a uh, thousand miles away? I don't know what. Um, you know, I'll probably see it here as we're going through. I do. They are they are saying that they're going to have internet speeds of uh, 100 megabits down and 20 megabits up. Uh, that's their, the the tier that they're providing. So those are not. I, I know when. It, so anyone who watched earlier videos when you were on the on your Hughes satellite uh, network, what were your speeds? Do you recall? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was marketed as 25 by three. Right. And so this is 100 by 20 that he's going to be able to offer with these lower... 25 by 3 would have been fine, but the latency, the, the jitter and latency was just crazy. Uh, and anytime we do a lot of stuff on downstream that's TCP-based, 
that requires upstream acknowledgements, the downstream will never get 25. <laughs> yeah. The 25 was like a streaming service on downstream, right? Um, so yeah, it was uh, pretty difficult and painful to, <laughs> I'm sure other people watching, my lips would move three seconds after I talked. <laughs> and we'd, we'd hear you later, yes. Um, so uh, I don't I don't see, uh, I know that I had seen that before, but I, I'm sure the fact that they are able to achieve such high speeds, and I know their latency numbers, I'm not seeing that right now in the article, but the latency numbers are supposed to be under under well under 100 milliseconds because they said that an important aspect of this is is they support gaming on this mm -hmm. platform and so they're able to achieve low latency numbers mm -hmm. that is also an important aspect i think the fact that they are you know not only are they getting money from the government to help doing this but the fact that they're putting so many satellites in orbit more than we've put in, in since the history of going to space is an important but, but aspect I, of this. I suspect you know you throw up one rocket I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, it's like space trash. Yeah. <laughs> How big is the satellite, right? Is it, is it the size of a computer, a trash can, and one rocket can throw out a hundred of them at once? So, you know, so I, I don't know. that's an interesting point. Um, uh, SpaceX has to put some. They're putting something on their their uh, satellites that will make them. It's not that they make them invisible, but it it it's going to reduce the reflection that's coming back on the satellites uh, because a complaint from astronomers, people that are looking to the sky, is that mm -hmm. once they get all those satellites up there, there's going to be a lot of backscatter, light coming back from them. So uh, one of the requirements of, is that they put some shields on them that reduces the amount of sunlight that gets scattered back because this actually, there because there's going to be so many, as you say, junk, so many satellites up there, there is a concern that it would actually impact our ability to view the sky, view the stars, and continue our exploration of the universe so that that is something that they had to do after they got their first few satellites up is put some mitigation on there to reduce the backscatter that we're getting from light coming back in so actually interesting that you mentioned that now i, I think it's it, it'll definitely be kind of cool to see where it goes and if it is legitimate i wouldn't doubt the government will fund more money yeah you know? absolutely you know if you can if you can get it up and run, once the satellites are there if you can get it up and running to more rural areas that are underserved it's a matter of just turning it on probably right yeah uh, or getting the end device at the house i'm sure it must be is that what you were showing in the picture a satellite dish at the house yeah well, yeah it showed a small dish uh, and i i can't uh, i can either c confirm nor deny if that's the actual dish that they're <laughs> using but i i would imagine there, there's some has to be a dish that uh, of yeah. some sort that they're using to receive what what did you have when you had to use did you have a dish it was a, it was a dish that was bigger than direct tv and I would say it's um, 24 inch, maybe 30, 24 inch uh, diameter, two foot, two and a half foot, 30 inch maybe. I don't know, but uh, yeah, same same deal. You know, always pointing towards the uh, the equator, the south side. Right. Okay. Um, so next up, uh, there's an interesting article that talked about Huawei. And how they actually, and this was in Wired Magazine, how they got into the market for um, basically their error correction mechanism. So it talks about Huawei, 5G, and the man who conquered noise. Um, so uh, this guy, he is uh, comes from Turkey. He spent a lot of time uh, working under, uh, let's see if his name is in here. I won't find it. He he started he so he spent a lot of time working under the guy that created LDPC, and they've they basically created a new uh, improved algorithm called Polar Codes that is better than LDPC, and uh, so this is him Erdo Erkin. And he was born in 1958. He worked under Gallagher. Gallagher was the guy Robert Gallagher that created LDPC, and now um, Erdo created these polar codes that are now part of the 5G standard that is um, in Huawei's arena. And the, these polar codes, codes actually bring us even better error correction than we have in LDPC. Um, for, those of, for those who are familiar with LDPC, that's part of the DOCSIS 3.1 and 4.0 standard right now that really gives us the error correction that we need in order to, you know, do what we do with OFDM. The interesting thing about this is now polar code codes even get us closer to what's called the Shannon theory. 
Shannon theory is, you know, how good can we send data in a in an environment where there's impairments and stuff like that, um, with correcting those impairments and still being able to overcome the impair, you know, correcting the data in in the presence of the impairments with these polar codes that are part of 5G that Huawei owns. So this is their intellectual property and stuff that gives them a huge advantage because they they can correct errors even better than LDPC. And we were we were really excited about LDPC and Doxis because it's doing amazing things. But there's something even better than LDPC. And it's interesting that I think the you know, the aspect of this is that Huawei is really showing that they're a leader in the industry, a leader in the world of being able to develop these algorithms and show that they have technology advan more advanced than than we do, than, than the US it, does. Yeah, the LDPC, we always quote about 60B more robust um, than what the in internal tables we use for, for decisions on, for, on profile management. And those tables are in the cable lab spec. And those tables were based usually on theoretical breakpoints uh, but LDPC and time frequency interleaving and all that seems to give us about 60 dB more robustness than than the tables would suggest. I'm wondering if the uh, polar, what is it? Polar, polar codes. Codes. I'm wondering if if it's a straight up a dB or two, two dB more. Like how much more robustness does it get? Is it specific for multipath or added white Gaussian noise or just like what type of errors? I guess. If the errors are impulse related, normally you have a lot of errors in a row and interleaving helps that, right? By interleaving, those errors in a row are not in a row because right. you've interleaved them. And if they're spread out, then they look more random and then error correction can usually fix that. And that's how forward error correction usually work with error parity bits and stuff. But I, I'm not sure about the LDPC and and uh, the polar cord polar cord Polar codes. Codes. Polar codes. Like North Pole, South Pole. <laughs> All right, gotcha. <laughs> okay, the, yeah, that is interesting though with five G, because um, I'm I'm personally looking now into uh, radio uh, active networks, radio area networks, RANs. Yeah, a radioactive would be kind of concerning networks because <laughs> could do some cellular oh, damage. <laughs> radioactive networks <laughs> and cellular radio damage. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's. You know, the technology we deal with, all the architectures are sort of interrelated, right? Even when we went to DOCSIS 3.1 OFDMA, it's basically what people have been doing with mobile and some Wi-Fi stuff. And even the Wi-Fi uses some of the same, like, bonding techniques that we we came out with DOCSIS 2 or DOCSIS 3 with bonding. Wi-Fi is really doing the same thing to get higher speeds. They're bonding. Um, so it's, it's funny how all this stuff is kind of coming together and we all talk about technology agnostic, you know, not just going into one camp. And that's sort of why I like technology is understanding how one thing in our our little realm can work in another part or how they're exploiting it maybe, you know, right. better than right? All right. So the last thing I want to cover before we get into the main content is uh, I posted a video just a couple days ago about a threat or that has impacted a company many of us use called Solar Winds, their Orion product. So I just want to throw that out there in case anyone missed that. Please, if uh, if you are using Solar Winds, or Solar Winds Orion product, there is malware that has been injected in there. Uh, it is getting pretty good public coverage right now. But in case you missed it, and you're using, if you're using it, uh, you may want to stop, or you may want to make sure that uh, you're in contact with Solar Winds so you know what the right thing to do with your product is. That's out there and it's a problem. All right, moving into the main part of our content, John, we're going to talk about uh, 204 megahertz split and OFDMA. Why do we want to do it? So, so it's, uh, let's go take a step forward. Uh, DOCSIS 4.0, which the terminology was also ESD, Extended Spectrum DOCSIS. And extended spectrum DOCSIS, people are really focused on 1.8 gigahertz downstream. Right. But the only reason why we were even talking about 1.8 gigahertz downstream is because we're talking about increasing the upstream past 204. Mm -hmm. You know, 204 is part of the DOCSIS 3.0 spec, so it's already in the specification. 
Doxus 4.0, there's no Doxus 4.0 CPE on the market, uh, but we're hoping Doxus 4.0 will extend downstream so that we can extend the upstream. Um, I foresee the upstream going to maybe 396, somewhere around there, but the spec for 4.0 can extend the upstream to 684. So it's it's pretty far jump. Um, the question would be is, what do we have today? Well, 204 is in the spec. 204 is in a lot of the DOCSIS 3, uh, 3.1 CPE out in the field now, cable modems. Now those cable modems might have hard set filters or they might have SNMP or software controlled filters that you can activate the 204 upstream. So let's focus on the 204. You know, 42 it's called a sub split, 85 is called a mid split, 204 people are calling it a high split. So when we get to 396, we'll call it a higher split. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what we're gonna call it, an extended split or who knows. So the 204 high split, if we go from 42 to 204, that's five X, five times. What we currently have now. So two times is a hundred percent, four times, three times is a thousand percent, four times is a hundred. Well, Either way, it's a big Five percentage. times four is, is a little over, five times 42 megahertz is, is a little over 200. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's, it's a times. lot of spectrum that we can activate today if our outside plant would support it. You know, mm -hmm. the outside plant is the biggest conundrum. Um, the other conundrum would be, what do you do with the frequencies they're using on the downstream today from 54 to 204? Where do they go? You're hoping they all went away. You're We're hoping, hoping that we already yeah. made that that yeah. digital analog to digital yeah. migration. Oh. Analog's gone. Yes. But you might still have analog set top box or an out of band set top box at 75, uh, at 104. Um, so those have to go away. You know, if I'm going to do a four, 204 upstream, the other question would be if I do a 204 upstream and I was doing leakage testing at 133. Right. How do you do downstream leakage at 133 if your upstream's five to 204? Yeah. And, and so actually at SCT Expo, there were some really good papers put together on exactly how we address leakage going to, to 204 megahertz. And, and while I mentioned that, there was an email that came out today. Anyone who has not seen the SCT Expo recordings, those are going to go away uh, the end of the, I think the end of this year. So go out and, and either get those or, or watch those recordings, particularly if you're interested on what we're talking about now with doing leakage in a, when you go to like a 204 megahertz split, that is covered. There's a good paper on that. So we, we can address that, John. Yeah, you bring up a good point because I saw that they were going to remove it from uh, like the box folders or wherever it's being held, uh, depository. Yep. Um, what I what I wish they would have kept in those recordings is the chat sessions. Yeah. I noticed like two days later they were all gone because I had a lot of good chats in there with people uh, of actual information that went along with the presentations. But when I went back and looked at some of the presentations and the videos, the chat sessions were gone. But uh, there was some good information there too. But yeah, I think it was January something. I, I didn't know if it was the end of this, like in two weeks, or it was like January 6th or something. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah I know it's went. it's coming up soon. So if you haven't caught them, go catch them. So, so uh, yeah, so the 204, obviously more speed, OFDMA. Um, if we can get around some of the obstacles of out of band set top box signal, um, the leakage stuff you talked about, there are ways around that. One of the ways is just ignore it. <laughs> One of the ways is ignore it. And believe it or not, I believe uh, Comcast went to the FCC and, and said, you know, the upstream levels that we're going to have in that range or that frequency range isn't going to be uh, a leakage concern compared to what we had on the downstream, right? you know, in that frequency range, which I find interesting as well because – Aren't we going to have higher levels coming from the upstream? 50 dBmV at that frequency, 54 dBmV at that frequency coming from the house. You know, technically that frequency on the downstream, it should be like five, zero, right? Because downstream mm -hmm. levels should be close to zero at the house in that range somewhere. Well, there's there. no change going yeah. planned for that, right? The downstream high levels high are still going to be the be, same. It's, it's the, the return levels high that are going to be high. Because the, the cable modem is going to be transmitting at a pretty high level to get back to the CMTS. And, and I think that's the concern. Uh, we've got the aeronautical band in there. We've got other, you know, other bands that are, that are going to be problematic. Yeah. Um, 
so those are those are concerns that you're addressing from the standpoint of leakage signals getting out of the cable plan into the yeah. air i i i i thought this one idea was kind of cool would be test and here's the conundrum there would be people want to use existing test equipment and not really have to change anything they got uh, thousands it's not going to happen devices. they don't want to add you know have a cost but if you get a test equipment that's synchronized to cable modems on the CMTS and cable modem in 3.1, you can send a probing signal to tell the modem to probe. So if you said, all right, probe, and I synchronize the exact time that I did the probe, and I see the ingress coming out of the cable plant by looking around, then I know I have a leakage point. So I'm forcing the cable modem to transmit at 133 on the upstream, uh, and then I'm just looking around. That way, I can look at every endpoint and tell each endpoint cable modem to transmit when I'm in that area doing the test. Yeah, and, and that so was at, at Expo. Downstream, that was one of the what, one of the papers. In the downstream, it just broadcasts out. But on the upstream, we have nothing to send in, and mm -hmm. you have to do it at every endpoint. Yeah. You know, so what's at the endpoints? Well, the modems are at the endpoints. You know, so maybe we can do something like that in the, if it's if it's needed or required. Right. That's the question is, I think we're trying to get around some of it. Yeah. And, and I think uh, one of the expo papers, that's exactly what they talked about doing was using cable modems as the probe to to find a leakage or detect leakage. Yep. And, and you could do it that you could figure out quiet time and actually not even affect the customer's throughput, you know? Mm -hmm. The customer could still be doing throughput. He's cross bonding OFDMA with the single carrier qualm. And I'm just saying uh, carve out a little bit of uh, uh, six megahertz of the OFDMA just for the probe. That right. way the signal comes through. Because normally you're only going to test for when you do leakage testing, you're like testing for what? One megahertz or less? It's usually like a sliver of frequency, a frequency plus or minus like 10 kilohertz or something weird. Yeah. Don't you think the equipment vendors will see this as an opportunity, though? Uh, because they're not going to want to lose the business and have True. modems doing this. So they're going to develop custom tools for it. But but like I said, the, the modem's generating, but they still need the tool out in the field to capture it. Right. And that's where the equipment vendors will come in. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not going to do it unless it's needed. Right. right. <laughs> Supply and demand. The demand has to be there. Sure. So that's the leaky thing. Let's say all that goes away and we do a 204 upstream. Um, man, we could do a whole 96 megahertz OFDMA block in there. At the higher frequency, we could probably do 1K qualm, no problem. Uh, I suspect we could do 2K qualm. If we did remote five node plus one or two amplifiers, I bet you we could get 4K qualm to work on the upstream. Once you get up above, the, once you get outside of the noise and the return. And, and yeah. the premise here is assuming that we have a return that can handle that. So it's not going to be an analog laser. Uh, I think that an RPD could handle it, a remote FI device. What about a digital return? Because I think that's something that um, so people are looking that at too. Came, that just came up. And because uh, I always said, when we digitized the upstream, before there was actual digital fiber, remote FI and all that, uh, something called BDR, baseband digital reverse. Mm -hmm. We digitized the upstream signal. We sample it, we quantize it, and we send it back on a digital link. Yeah, you know, when right. Mia and I worked at C-Core, we, uh, we worked on a digital return there. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> that you worked there. <laughs> <laughs> so the BDR was a great technology to get better MER and technically no laser clipping because if the laser is just on, off, on, off, there's no, there's no intensity modulation. It's just pulses, right? It's digital. You could still clip the A to D because you had to convert analog to digital signal before you feed a digital laser. So that A to D could have compression. So that's still so, it's a that that's an analog conversion in the A to D. But aren't aren't you yeah. doing an analog to digital conversion in an RPD as well? Don't you still um, have that opportunity to do the clipping that you're talking about? But you're cutting out that entire step. You're decoding the signal right there at that point. But it's still You're an not, A to D, whether it's a not, whether it's a digital return or an RPD return, it's still an A to D when you're doing the demodulation. But that's in the chipset, right? The Broadcom, Intel, 
TI chipset is con uh, uh, mm. Yeah, I know what you're saying there. It's still analog signal coming in. No, you no. overload the A to D on either the device. It's overloaded. It's reading an, an analog QAM signal, right? Yeah. And it's converting it in a chipset. It's not a pure RF signal in the sense of a single carrier QAM, uh, analog signal that has to digita sample it, digitize it, and then send a digital stream. I, I would I would say maybe where the benefit is between a, a digital return and an RPD return is in a digital return, you're not going to know that you have that you've overdriven that analog to digital converter until that signal gets all the way back to the head end and into the CMTS. And at that oh, point, all the CMTS knows is it has noise. With an RPD, and this is a question for you, does, does an RPD, because it's going to sense that its input is being clipped, that, that analog to digital converter is being clipped, does an RPD have any type of front-end attenuator where it could it could adjust the signals coming into that analog to digital converter to say, hey, it's being clipped, let's, let's attenuate those signals. Auto calibration functionality, like a gain stage that's auto calibrating. And uh, which can can kind of mess you up in another way is now that you configure an upstream with multiple signals, what if you configure the upstream signals with disparate levels? And then the gain stage is like, which signal do I auto correct for? This is in the RPD. Because on a on an RPD or CMTS upstream port, you might say that upstream port now is going to contain four single carrier qualms and OFDMA. And on CMTS, I'm going to configure the OFDMA for plus three and the single carrier qualms for minus three. Mm -hmm. But now the signals come in at different levels because you configure different levels. And now the gain stage has to calibrate each one or figure out how to calibrate those right. before it hits the A to D. But I want to, I want to go down that path of BDR with 42 megahertz. Then we came out with EDR, enhanced digital return for 85 megahertz. And we said, well, now that we're 85, to go to 204, Man, we're gonna require a huge, very fast digital link if we need to sample 204, multiply by 2.2 usually for Nyquist sampling, do 10-bit quantization. To do a 204, it's gonna be five gigabits per second for one RF leg. So we didn't think anyone was gonna do it. And I just saw a report a couple of days ago from Comscope Eris said they're going to do it. They're doing a 204 digital return uh, transmitter. I'm like, a transceiver. I was like, wow, awesome. Um, I guess if we run the numbers, let's see if it works. So if I want to do a one by two RPD, you know, one downstream, two upstream, mm -hmm. uh, and separate the upstream, I'd need a 10 gigabit per second laser. Well, with SFPs, 10 gig, it's really not that expensive anymore. Right. It's doable. And when you do digital fiber, you can do 40 wavelengths instead of 16 when you do analog fiber. So here's the rub to all this is it's good and bad. You're going to digitize the upstream, but your downstream is still analog. You're not digitizing that downstream out to one gigahertz. That would right. be ludicrous, ludicrous speed. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get Elon Musk back for that. <laughs> so the downstream is still analog, which in one case is kind of cool because you can still do test equipment, out-of-band signals, CLI, AGC signals. You know, it's all analog. So you didn't change anything on the downstream. You didn't do a remote buy. Right. It's still analog downstream. So in that regard, it's business as usual. On the upstream, you could do a 204 with this new digital return. Now, I read some of the specs on it and said it, it mentioned something about uh, without regard to distance or something like that. I'm like, yeah, but your cable modem still has a distance limitation for the downstream. Mm -hmm. The downstream is still analog. The analog fiber is still a delay. That distance, according to DOCSIS, went from 100 miles, and it dropped into 50 miles in DOCSIS 3.0. Right. People can still do 100 miles because CMTS is having changed their map advance. So, But the spec says 50 miles. So it is nice that I have a digital return, but it's not going to really do me any good for distance because the downstream is still analog. Um, but it's going to be better MER because it's digitized. Like you just mentioned, we started this whole discussion on 204. We're probably not going to do an analog laser. Right. I'm afraid of analog laser. We're going to laser. overload that laser, the analog laser. 85 megahertz, you know? Yeah. So the answer is either DAA, distributed access architecture, remote PHY, uh, remote MACPHY, or 
you keep the downstream analog and do it some type of digital return that's digitizing it. Um, the, the question will be, uh, how does that A to D handle the 204 coming in? If it, and if it handles it well, there's no problems. But if it gets yeah. clipped, I think to your point, then you start to run into similar problems that you do with an analog return. What about uh, tilt? Since we're going to 204 megahertz, are, are we still running a flat return or do we start to have tilt? Because we have now we have coax attenuation that is uh, not is, flat. Yeah, this is, um, this is a problem as well that a lot of people that don't know RF or don't work with it understand. Um, and if you look at the spec for 3.0, 3.0 stopped at 85 megahertz. To my surprise, they didn't increase this one feature called DRW, dynamic range window, when they went to DOCSIS 3.1. They kept the same 12 dB dynamic range window, which meant coming out of the modem, you can't have more than 12 dB of difference between all the channels. So you could say 12 dB till coming out of the modem, because the modem is going to put out whatever it needs to hit the CMTS flat. Well, when we go through coax, that is uh, half inch coax, drop cable, um, and we go higher frequency, we all know there's more loss in coax at higher frequencies. So the modem is going to have to transmit higher at higher frequencies to get back to the CMTS at zero. So the modem is going to have to transmit with a tilt to come back and hit the CMTS flat. Well, that tilt better be less than 12 dB, or it's going to fail a dynamic range window. It's not going to register properly or with the full spectrum. It would have to range with a, a sub-bonding group, like a smaller bonding group. So how can I fix this? The biggest fix that I would recommend is not step attenuators, but condition taps. We call it flexible solution taps, EQ taps. Um, if I can't afford to upgrade my taps to taps that have not flat loss, but the taps have tilted signals, maybe a field inline equalizer mid-span, right where you'd have maybe a, a 14 dB tap. And you have what we would normally do in a downstream, you know, inline EQ, you make sure the equalization goes from five all the way to 1.2 gigahertz. There's no diplex filter in there. There's no five to 42, and then the tilt is only from 54 to one gig. You want the tilt to be from five all the way extrapolated all the way up, either tilted or positive, negative, whatever makes sense. I think it would be yeah, negative. Um, this would help the modems on low value tabs transmit higher level. It also make sure that uh, when you look at signals at different frequencies, they're going to see different loss in the tap because of the EQ. So instead of EQing the cable modem signal, you might be able to come out a little bit flatter on the cable modem because you're EQing the tap. Right. You understand? Mm -hmm. So do you see, and you see all this happening when, when an operator upgrades their return, they should be planning on this, on doing this reverse equalization at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's going to be part of the whole balancing of that plant. It's no longer going to be, as we've said before, flat balancing the return, 17 in, 17 out. It's going to be a tilted balancing of the return plant. So, it, and it's going to be, this is going to be a lot of work. Well, no, it's, it's, it's still unity gain and flat at the amplifiers because you want flat at the CMTS. But it's going to be tilted coming out of your modem unless you can compensate at the tap to get rid of some of the modem tilt to finally hit the CMTS flat. Um, or, when you say the MLR, modem tilt, oh. though, you're looking at, a, at an OFDMA channel from that perspective. Well, and and compared to the other single carrier qualms as well, if there are some, I'm sure there will be. Yeah, I'm not I'm not totally following you when you because when I think of tilt, I think of when it's you know tilt coming out of an amplifier. So you're you have tilt coming out of that amplifier, but mm -hmm. you're you're saying it's still going to be um, it's still going to be flat coming out of it. It's going to be unity gain. Uh, you kind of lost me there, John. No, it'll be tilt for upstream. You look at inputs, not outputs. Mm -hmm. So the up Upstream inputs will be flat. Okay. The upstream outputs will be tilted. Of course, of course. Okay. Because that's where you do the pad and EQ is the output of the upstream amplifier. Right. To tilt it to hit the next amplifier flat. Okay. So, and that, from that standpoint, it is unity gain. When you go to the next amplifier, the input of that amplifier is going to be flat, but we want to launch out of it with tilt. Yeah. And and I would, and to, to give myself some headroom on this, 
and, and knowing I have some breathing room with Doxa 3.1 modem supporting higher power than a 3.0 modem. When you compare apples to apples, a 3.1 modem is 5 to 8 dB more power than a 3.0 modem. Mm -hmm. If you did the same channel lineup, you know, whatever the 3.0 modem could do. So that's that's a one good thing. The other thing is I I feel like if I designed my, like say you, you do strand mapping and you design your power levels and you say, well, what levels do I want my modems to transmit? That, I would that was the question. I, the next question I was going to ask you, because even though they have higher transmit power, we, we still have that normal, we'd like our modems to transmit between 40 to 50 dBmV. Is it the same for DOCSIS 3.1? Here, here would be my utopian world if I could do this. But if Here's what I would shoot for. 48 dBmV transmit plus or minus three. So 45 to 51. That's the center of the bell curve. Yeah, 48. That's what I would design for. That's the tap I would design, the equalization I would design with assume maybe 10 dB total loss from house to tap, um, 48 transmit. Now, why because 48? Know, Where, why, not for, why not 45? You always want to transmit at the higher end to get better at MER. And since and DOCSIS 3.1 modems transmit higher than 3.0 modems, you're shifting that, design, that bell curve up a little. If I design for higher levels, I'm going to put in taps and conditioning to force higher levels. Mm -hmm. And that extra conditioning is going to drop noise from the house where the noise comes from. Right. right? So in the end, yes. then, we would expect 3.1 modems to have a little better SNR, MER than 3.0 modems because they're transmitting a couple of the dB or 3 dB and higher. Because than... you designed it with more attenuation, Every modem is going to have better MER because right. the attenuation is noise funneling or the noise is noise funneling yep. and the attenuation drops that noise for everybody. So in the head end, the whole noise floor should drop if you design properly. So here's what I'm saying is if I design 48 plus or minus three for the first few taps off of an amplifier, I have a nice bottom, low, nice headroom. But what happens when you get to the taps that are farther away and you don't have equalized taps, and you're going to 204, and then it goes from 30 degrees out to 100 degrees out, the sun is shining on black jacketed aerial cable, and you have five spans of coax. We'd have modems now, go offline. That tilt that was 7 dB actually goes to 12 dB yep. because of the attenuation of, and the temperature effects. So. With that in mind, because we don't have upstream AGC, here's two fixes for it. We start selling amplifiers that have an upstream AGC based on downstream pilots. You just look at the downstream pilot AGC. If it changes by a dB at 633 megahertz, you extrapolate it and say, well, that'd be 0.5 dB at 200 megahertz. You just do a simple calculation and you decide on the upstream pin diode for whatever the downstream does. You know, if you downstream to 755 megahertz pilot and it changes by 2 dB for this span of coax, well, that span of coax downstream is the same span for upstream. So what you do is you look at the downstream pilot and decide on upstream AGC based on the downstream pilot. Because you're not gonna have an upstream pilot. <laughs> There's nothing on the upstream. There's nothing continuous besides noise, <laughs> besides CB radio. So I ask you and also anyone in the chat room, if you know, do, do you know of any vendors that are actually looking at designing a return AGCs at this point in time? Not yet. No. And so, and knowing that, if you look at where we're going, we're trying to do node plus less amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So if it's less amplifiers, it's less coax, we don't need it, right? But if I want to do node plus five, I'm not going to do FDX because I can't do node plus five with FDX. And I want to stick with node plus five and I have aerial cable and I want to do 204 and it eventually goes 396. Yeah, we're going to need something like this. Yeah. Especially for the 396, the 684 or whatever we're going to do in the upstream. Well, I think the the challenge is going to be that 12 dB DRW that you're talking about. And, there, and there's, there's two places where I see the, the challenge. I mean, one is first of all, having technicians just understand why is the modem offline? Um, and, and that modem is going to be offline because it's exceeded the 12 dB DRW bandwidth. Um, the second opportunity is for test equipment vendors to build that test into their meters so that when they're, when they're performing that cable modem test, automatically have that built in and flag it for technicians to say, hey, you've exceeded this, 
uh, this bandwidth window. We're, we're outside of the 12 dB window, and that's why we're having issues. Uh, you know, maybe the test meter can can uh, still work outside of the 12 dB window, whereas the cable modem wouldn't, and that would that would be very helpful for end users. Yeah, it could be. It could be you didn't even deploy out the 204 yet. You know, you had licensing issues or whatever, and you're like, yeah, we only want to do a 48 megahertz of FDMA. We went out to 110 megahertz from 85 to 110. But once I activate the rest of the spectrum, I could fail that DRW. Right. So test equipment out there, like doing a sweep and all that, reverse sweep, upstream sweep, you'd be able to figure that out right away. It would pretty determine for sweep you. Upstream would do it, right? So I didn't even finish my design idea. It was, and so I ran numbers on temperature and coax and how much I would really fluctuate at 204. And I came to the conclusion that once I exceed about 25 dB of coax at 204, from the RPD to my modem, I should design that tap that feeds that modem for 46 dBmV plus or minus two. I want to give myself two dB more window for the temperature effect that is going to occur on that coax going back. Mm -hmm. Understand? Yep. So I, I think if I didn't have flexible solution taps and I didn't have upstream conditioning in my taps and step attenuators or any of that stuff, um, that's the route I would go. I would I would design for 48 plus or minus three for the high value taps. The low value taps, I could say low value taps, but really, because you don't have upstream AGC, it's not tap to amplifier, it's tap all the way to the RPD, because all that coax is affected by temperature. Mm -hmm. This next amplifier doesn't have AGC, so it's not gonna make up for it, right? So I, I gotta look at the, the loss of coax from the RPD all the way to the, the tap I'm talking about. And I figured about 25 dB at 204. So for a half inch cable, that could be, I don't know, a thousand feet or so, maybe 2000 feet, I don't know. So, and you mentioned earlier, you said no diplex filters. Do you see that when we go to 204, are, are you thinking that it's gonna be a diplex filterless? A, a so world? that's we had that talk with Technetics, right? Yeah, they exactly. Had diplex serless amplifiers. Yep. I, I thought that was an interesting idea, uh, and it works for a linear architecture where you have node or RPD and amplifier, 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 but it doesn't work well when you have node, amplifier, and cas not just cascade, but you break off because everywhere you break off is a splitter or a directional coupler. And when you looked at their design of seven to 10 dB of upstream gain, right? Mm -hmm. It was like seven, 10 dB upstream gain. I lose half of that in the diplex filter or the di directional coupler or the splitter. So how do I have two amplifiers have unity gain if all the gain is eaten up by the splitter in between? So we had that talk with Paul and those guys. They said, well, we're thinking about making a non-passive passive, an active passive. It's like an oxymoron. It was like a non-loss passive. Yeah. Well, I saw they came so, out with an announcement that they had a, a another amplifier they came out with. A non-loss passive. Yeah. So basically, you're putting amplification in the passive. Right. To make up for In every passive. tap. Yeah. That's basically yeah, what I I your goal was. But, so to me, I think in the RPD side, because this goes out of the amplifier side now, I'll let those guys do whatever they want. I'd like to see a diplex or less amplification so I could dynamically change the upstream whenever I wanted. Um, but from the RPD side, I could see uh, just a, a pluggable diplex filter because there's not that many as far as amplifiers, there's thousands of amplifiers. But RPDs, go to 204, if I want to go to 396, you're probably going to make one more change in your life before you retire. And you'll probably do a 396, you know? Yeah. Well, we have, so, we have a good question in, a, in the chat room that I, I, I think we should talk about that goes on this. It uh, says here, once you've upgraded the 85105, which there's a number of plants that have done that, is it cost effective to upgrade to 204 megahertz or just go straight to DOCSIS 4.0, which I think going straight to DOCSIS 4.0 implies maybe the full duplex 
path, the FDX path. Well, so, let's address the elephant in the room there. Yeah. You're not going to do full duplex with N plus five. Yeah. You're just not going to do FDX with N plus five. Yeah. So I would say if you go directly to four point out docs is four oh, which is full duplex, then you have to go to node plus zero or node plus zero with full duplex capable amplifiers, which but but four O is made up of two things. It's FDX or ESD. Yeah. So I think the first question is if you've gone to 85 megahertz, is it cost effective to upgrade to 204? Well, the only reason you're going to upgrade to 204 is if you need the return bandwidth. So it may not be a question of is it cost effective? Is it you may have to upgrade to 204 megahertz? What because... I would say is if, and this has been holding true for the last 10 years, we keep upgrading because of competitive pressure to offer higher speeds. So the question will be, do I have to offer one gig on the upstream? Right. If I have to offer one gigabit per second on the upstream, I better have an aggregate on the upstream of at least 1.3, 1.5 gig to offer a one gig service to a handful of customers. Just yeah. to keep a handful happy, right? And I can market it, even though no one signs up for it, I can still market it and keep the competitive pressure off my back. And that's... So and that's a legit thing because there are a lot of comments on our YouTube channels from subscribers that, that is, that's a big complaint from them. They fundamentally do not understand why a, a telecom like AT&T can offer gig down and gig up, but cable operators can off, only offer gig down and, and they can't offer anything close to gig up. And that's because the asymmetry of our networks. Yeah. So I, I think that's that can be pressure that says you need to upgrade to 204 well, I, if you I, have an incumbent I, that's offering gig up speeds and subscribers see, that are leaving you because of that. You'll see other MSOs say, well, we'll cherry pick Epon, Gpon. That's an alternative because solution. And that might be a more economical office, solution. Yeah, if you already have the back office, it's a no brainer. Yep. Right? But it's that first initial implementation that's going to cost you, right? The, the back office stuff, and the, everything else that goes, not just putting the uh, an, uh, NID or NIU or whatever inside the house. Uh, it's everything. But you might cherry pick and say, all right, I'll just stick with gig service on the EPON, GPON. Um, but once I want to offer ubiquitously across the entire footprint, even though no one's only a few people sign up, you could do it with 204. You could say, yeah, uh, I'm going to offer one gig on this one node, but I only need to upgrade 10 amplifiers in a node. I'm done. Yeah. You know, at least for that service group. Like maybe you don't need to offer every service group. Yeah. So it can be very tactical where you do it. Yeah. Um, all right. Another question from the from the chat room here. Uh, it's from Mike Collins. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Sorry, joined late. Question, what portion of the wide OFDMA does the CMTS use to determine power level of the OFDMA? <laughs> That's a good question because uh, it's been coming up lately. You know, when you go from 3.0 to 3.1, there's been one problem that comes up is modem transmit level. The spec says you must report the transmit level in a 1.6 megahertz bandwidth equivalent. So even if the 3.1 modem is in 3.0 mode, it's doing single carrier qualm, no OFDMA, it will transmit and report 6 dB lower than the 3.0 modem. So if you just take a 3.0 modem out and put a 3.1 modem in, it's going to say 6 dB lower because 10 times the log of 6.4 divided by 1.6 is 6 dB. So there is a misconception of the modem transmit level because of how the specs says it has to be reported. It's not reporting based on the channel. It's reporting based on 1.6. So you have to do a correction factor. That's one thing. The other one that Mike is talking and alluding to is when I do OFDMA, how are the power levels really negotiated? And it turns out it's negotiated based on 6.4 megahertz and wherever the initial ranging frequency is. So if you have an OFDMA channel up towards 204, so it's 100 to 200, whatever, 96 megahertz wide, Cisco CMTS puts the IR, the initial ranging, one third up from the bottom edge. But you can set the IR anywhere you want. So if you set the IR even lower, it might be better in regards to transmit level negotiation because it's lower in frequency. But what happens to the rest of the OFDMA when it has to do the fine ranging? Well, the internal equalization for 3.1, it'll make the OFDMA tilt. So we've been talking about tap tilt and all that. There's still OFDMA tilt. 
for fine ranging. So I will range our initial ranging frequency, negotiate based on 6.4 megahertz, report based on 1.6, <laughs> and then I'll do fine ranging to make sure all the subcarriers are actually putting out enough to hit this MTS flat. Right. Yeah, there's a lot going on in there. Cool. Um, all right. And Brian Wilson says DPOE is sexy. So I think that's tying back into what we were talking about, that cable operators uh, may use EPON or DPON and DOCSIS provisioning over Ethernet, which is what DPOE stands for, allows cable operators to use the same provisioning system that they're using for their cable modems to provision PON devices. Um, so, Brian, thanks for throwing that in. I know so, you so, love DPOE. So let's, let's uh, rain on his parade. Let's oh, rain boy. On his parade, see what he comes back with. If I do EPON, GPON, or even DOCSIS provisioning over EPON, how do you offer video service? to a legacy set-top box. You know, I think that's the that's the challenge for everyone, right? Is if you want to get rid of legacy video, we we have to or and, and go to fiber, we have to get rid of the legacy set talk legacy set top boxes. And I, and I'm not even and talking about And that's an expensive analog. expensive about, proposition. Yeah, you're talking about anything that's MPEG2 has to go away. Yep. All your video has to be IP video. It has to be MPEG4 IP over the top video because you have a uh, uh, fiber to the home that's ethernet it you it's know. why we have our fog i know right there <laughs> <laughs> i said it there you go <laughs> some of it some of our fog is actually coming back around and people are looking at it so <laughs> there's always a gotcha on everything you bring up brady and this is the gotcha for our fog and ofdma from cisco's pers perspective we don't support ofdma on our fog yep we support four channel upstream bonding. Eight channel upstream bonding works, but was never officially tested. Yeah, and I'm glad you bring that up again in part of this conversation because I get that question a lot about RFOG and OFDMA. It's an issue if you have RFOG and you're thinking about running OFDMA. Yeah. I, I recommend stick below 85 megahertz because I don't think they make a 204 RFOG transmitter anyway. So if it's 85, Go with eight single carrier qualms, so three O modems can do it, and you can get 216 megabit per second aggregate. And because it's our fog, you're not really stat muxing with everybody else at one time. Everybody's individual transmitter, receiver. Mm -hmm. You are combining into a 32 way optical combiner, or whatever, but you don't, I think, I don't think you have to abide by the same rule of thumb of the aggregate has to be 2x of what you're trying to offer. Like if it's a 216 aggregate, I bet you could offer 200 meg service from an R5 home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and Brian does say IPTV, that's the solution. And I and I think a lot of cable operators, if you're not already looking at your IPTV strategy, it's something you really should start looking at now because it it is it's gonna make things a lot easier for you in the future. IPTV is the way to go. It, it's it's reminding me of the analog. MPEG-2 digital simulcast that's been happening that happened for like five years until people transitioned to full MPEG-2 and got rid of analog. Right. Now we're doing an MPEG-2, MPEG-4 simulcast where you're seeing over the top HBO, over the top ABC, over the top this, that. Peacock is, is NBC. Whatever they're over the top is Peacock. Who has the Peacock for the, the NBC or ABC? Comcast or the NBC. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it might be NBC, but they have an over top called Peacock, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but they still have the, the 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 ABC or NBC or all those. So after a while, those will go away, and then it will just be all over the top. Yes, yes. All right, so we've got a few more minutes left, John. Anything else uh, on 204 megahertz return or OFDMA that uh, you think you want to cover? It's critical. Let's see. I'm actually going to look at... <laughs> I'm gonna look at look at your notes that you had yeah, for the first yeah. time in the show. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, do you have those that email I sent you? That one no, time? no, I don't. Uh, I don't have that up. I think we covered everything that we wanted to, John. Okay, so, um, anything you want to plug coming up? Um, yeah, you. Um, so I, I see that uh, SCTE now will be officially. Part of cable Labs. Yes, that did happen. That did go through. Yep. Uh, I haven't heard anything yet about if Cable Lab 
members get a free SCTE membership. I thought that might be happening, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I did not see that. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm trying to convince uh, uh, Chris, Bastian, and Steve um, <laughs> that any speaker of SCTE should get a one full free year. <laughs> that would be awesome. I think that's great. <laughs> he said he was going to look into it. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't. I just did a um, Southern California SCTE chapter, an hour and a half presentation on uh, capacity uh, planning, congestion. You know, some CMTS stuff I did for SCTE. Uh, I did that for the Southern California uh, SCTE last week. So yeah, it's it's been pretty busy. You know, it's all all the WebEx and Zoom and TeamSpace stuff and. Um, makes it much easier to get hold of people and do remote training, record it, um, and look at it later on. All right. Very good, then. John, thank you for your time today. Another great episode. Uh, everyone, appreciate a thumbs up and uh, hit the subscribe button. Our next episode is episode 70, John, on January 15th. Um, you can watch us live or record on YouTube download our podcast. Um, thanks so much for watching, everyone, and we'll catch you next month. Take care, John, and everyone have a happy holidays. Happy holidays.